Hello everyone, welcome back to another episode of Decoding the Unknown. I'm your host Simon Wamis here, one of my writers. In this case, Ilza writes me a script. What happens to the SS Waratah? We're going to read it together and it starts with a letter. Dear Diary, My second voyage to Australia proved uneventful. It was so good to feel the sea spray on my hull again. <laughs> Is this letter told from the perspective of a boat? This is the weirdest start of a decoding the unknown ever. After the little incident on my first trip, I was worried that I would be stuck in those dry docks forever. We've delivered our precious cargo and passengers. <laughs> Wait, is this going to Australia? When is it going? <laughs> it's like a boat to Australia. Precious cargo and criminals. And the crew is scurrying about to load everything for our next trip. Humans are such strange little creatures digging things up here and there. Loading it onto ships to take there only to load stuff up and send it back here again. I don't mind. I'm a ship. Sailing is what I do best. Tomorrow morning we leave for Durban. We might pick up a passenger or two, but we won't stay long. Then onwards to Cape Town. I'm a little nervous the waters there are treacherous. I trust my captain and my crew, but we don't know each other that well just yet. I can't tell what they're about to do, and I know they feel the same about me. The ship's in dry dock. Told me not to worry. Another voyage or two, and we'll soon understand each other. Good thing I'm unsinkable. <laughs> Any ship that is described as unsinkable never go on that ship. Have we not learned our lesson? <laughs> There's no such thing as unsinkable ships. Use your common sense. Look at the Titanic. Look at those modern cruise liners. It's a hundred years later. Sometimes they still sink. Look at that Costa Concordia. It like fell on its side. <laughs> oh, I shouldn't be laughing. Many people died. Yep. Well, look, don't get on any, any ship that bills itself as unsinkable. Too much effort has gone into the marketing and not enough effort has gone into making it, you know, less sinkable. Welcome aboard. In 1908, the Blue Anchor Line launched their brand new flagship, SS Waratah, on a maiden voyage from London to Australia. Built by Barclay, Carl and Co., the Waratah was a 456-foot luxury liner. And since her design was based on the G-Long, a ship that had an uneventful career, the Waratah was to be the pride of the Blue Anchor Line fleet. Never mind, it's not taking convicts. It's a, a luxury liner. I guess people went to Australia for fun. I've never been to Australia. I'd love to go to Australia, but even now, it's like a 24, it's like 24 hours in a plane. It's crazy. I can't believe how far away Australia is. I think because you have to, like, I don't know, for me, I'd probably have to, like, fly to Amsterdam or London and then fly to, it's, you've got to lay over in Asia, right? You can't get all the way to Australia, but it's enormously far. And, uh, I don't know what, like a week's vacation to spend, like, basically three days by the time you're all done flying there. It's just crap. The only time I'd ever, like, <laughs> the only reasonable time is to visit Australia is if you're f***ing moving there. <laughs> Although I would really like to go. I watched these Australian shows on Netflix. I watched, there was one about murders or something. It was really good. And I think I've said this before, but to me, as a British person, you know, exposed to lots of American culture because of Hollywood or whatever, Australia is like, it seems like a bizarro mix between the UK and and america it's like some things seem very american like specific like california and stuff it seems like the weather's always nice people like have a funny accent but then you look at the police and they all look like british police like with the the blue lights and the, the cars and i don't know if they have guns maybe not who knows next who cares you're not here for that you're here for the what, what's today's video about? I already forgot. <laughs> oh, the SS Waratah, yes. The Waratah was a combination passenger and cargo vessel. She would take European emigrants to Australia and return with freight. For the comfort of her passengers, she had 100 first-class cabins, 8 state chambers, a saloon decorated with crimson Waratahs, and even a music chamber. Wait, what is a Waratah? What is this? I thought it was the name of the ship. An Australian shrub which bears slender leathery leaves, leaves and clusters of crimson flowers. Okay, brilliant. <laughs> I'm so glad I know that. And even a music chamber. The cargo holds could be converted into dormitories for up to 700 more passengers when not carrying freight. <laughs> so it's like, it's either you're staying in a luxury first class stateroom or you're staying the 700 people crammed into a dormitory, which is primarily designed for freight. Wow. <laughs> That's not like business and first, is it? Or like economy and business, you know. The di Although there is a big difference. But 
that is a that that's a bigger difference in total she could carry up to a thousand passengers or fifteen thousand tons of cargo and still maintain 13 knots per hour the waratah was also equipped with state-of-the-art desalination equipment that could produce drink drinking water from seawater and carry enough supplies to last a whole year at sea radios weren't standard issue yet but she was supposed to be fitted with radio upon her return from her second trip to australia sadly she never made it home for that vital upgrade instead she vanished giving rise to one of the most enduring nautical mysteries what whoa this giant ship just disappeared i mean well it obviously sank right it's like what's the mystery she sank and you know what's really big the oceans the oceans are massive and deep so deep a mysterious disappearance the waratah's second trip from london to adelaide went smoothly she left adelaide on the 7th of july 1909 for her return to london and arrived at the port of durban on july the 25th two passengers disembarked in durban oh, one was hoping to find a job and another had some really bad dreams okay <laughs> It's like, why'd you get up in, a ra up in a random city when you were planning on going halfway around the world? I had a real bad dream last night. Real bad dream. What? I have recurring dreams of plane crashes. I don't know why, but it's like I'm always on a plane and then the plane crashes and you're like, oh god, I knew it. I knew this is how it was going to go. If I die in a plane crash, that's because of all my. It's the dreams. I knew it was coming! I'm kind of psychic. I have a fit sense. And people will watch this video back and they'll be like, he knew it. He knew it. I don't even fly that much. So, you know, was, oh God. Now I feel like I've cursed it somehow, haven't I? <laughs> people are going to be like, this was so weird. And now that I've said I've cursed it, people are going to be like, it's so double weird. Oh, no. oh, Christ. Why can't I just take all that back? Fortunately, I don't believe any of that nonsense. And people are going to point to that as well now. <laughs> It doesn't mean anything, it's just a coincidence. She left Durban for the port of Cape Town, carrying 211 passengers and crew and 6,500 tons of cargo on July the 26th at 8 p.m. She was expected to arrive in Cape Town on the 29th. According to port officials, the Waratah left the port upright and stable. The weather was fine, and if Captain Ibery, Ilbery, blip, 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 was uh, an experienced and respected mariner, had any doubts about reaching Cape Town in one piece, he kept it to himself. Well, I just assumed he was... <laughs> why would he be like i don't know if this voyage is gonna go well it's like captain what are you saying why would we leave if you're unsure it's a simple journey captain on july the 27th early in the morning the waratah caught up with the sss clan mcintyre using signal lamps the two ships exchanged names and destinations this was common practice before radios became standard issue since there was no other way to keep track of ships at sea waratah reported strong southwest and southerly winds but no issues and the clan mcintyre logged the encounter in their logbooks the senior crew of the clan mcintyre noted that the waratah was upright and steaming fast and she didn't appear to be experiencing any problems she was making around 15 knots with the help of the strong agulous current being a much faster ship than the clan mcintyre she finally disappeared from view at around 9 30 a.m in the vicinity of the xora river mouth this would be the last confirmed sighting of the ss waratah the search is on when the Waratah didn't arrive in Cape Town at the expected time, there was no immediate cause for concern. Ships being delayed for a few days or even weeks wasn't uncommon. Besides, she was unsinkable. What could possibly go wrong? This is pre-Titanic, right? What did we say? 1909? 1909, yeah. So, Titanic was 1911? 1912? Ooh, I'm not sure. It was the winter. Maybe the winter of 1911? Who cares? Whatever. However, the Clan McIntyre finally arrived in Cape Town after weathering a severe storm, and concern began to grow. According to the captain of the Clan McIntyre, the weather worsened on, uh, later on July the 27th after their encounter with the Waratah, and soon became the worst storm he'd ever experienced in his 13 years at sea, with winds up to 50 knots, 90 kilometers per hour, and waves up to 30 feet, 9 meters. That is... <laughs> That is a big wave. Um, okay, so mystery solved. There was a big ass storm and it sunk it. Why is this an episode of Decoding the Unknown? <laughs> we believe there's aliens. It's a giant squid. No, look, the guy said there was a fat storm and that's what sunk the goddamn ship. Case closed. End of. But not really. We're like a, a, like a fifth of the way through. <laughs> Let's see. Let's carry on. This better get more mysterious, Ilza. Uh, 
No. The Elovo had a similar tale to tell. Her deck cargo had been swept overboard, and her captain had to jettison 30 tons of coal when the Elovo started listing unhappily off Danger Point. This did not bode well for the Waratah. Soon more ships that left Durban after the Waratah began arriving in Cape Town with no reports or sightings of the SS Waratah. Initially, it was hoped that the Waratah had simply run into mechanical issues and was helplessly adrift. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, or, it could have been that massive storm. And I'm not saying don't go look for her, but... But there was a big... It was the worst storm that guy had ever seen in all of his years of being a sea dog. The first search was launched on the 1st of August 1909 by the tugboat T. Fuller. However, due to bad weather, he had to aban she had to abandon her search and return to port. The Royal Navy deployed the HMS Pandora, HMS Fort, and then later the HMS Hermes to find the Waratah and rescue her passengers and crew. However, the Hermes, while searching the area where the Waratah had last been seen encountered, saw such rough seas that she suffered hull damage and was placed in dry dock once she returned to port. The Blue Anchor Line chartered the cargo ship Sabine, fitted with searchlights and other equipment find their wayward ship. She covered 14,000 miles, that's 22,500 kilometers, in a systematic 88-day search, but still nothing was found. On August the 10th, 1909, news reached Australia from South Africa. Blue Anchor vessel, sighted at considerable distance out, slowly make for Durban. Could be Waratah. The chair of the House of Representatives in the Australian Parliament halted proceedings to read the cable, and in Adelaide, the town bells were rung in celebration. Sadly, the joy was premature. The ship spotted was not the Waratah. Finally, in December 1909, the Waratah was listed as officially missing by Lloyds of London. However, family and friends of the passengers of the ill-fated ship weren't willing to give up just yet. In February 1910, they managed to get funding for another ship, the SS Wakefield, to, to search for the Waratah. What are they hoping to find? They're like on some desert island somewhere? That just happens in novels. They're all dead. I'm sorry. The Wakefield logged heavy seas, and the engine speed had to be reduced. A lookout was kept from the crow's nest during the day, and she covered around 15,000 miles in total, but the Waratah still remained missing. The Blue Anchor Line's other ship, the Greelong, deviated from her route from Cape Town to Adelaide to help search the area east of South Africa where the Waratah was thought to be adrift. The German steamship Goslar also kept a lookout for the Waratah while sailing from Port Elizabeth to Melbourne. However, the SS Waratah, with 211 souls on board, had simply vanished. It was months later. And they're like, even if she's adrift, they've all either abandoned ship in the hope of getting to land or something, or they've all they're they're all just dying because there's not going to be enough food. And oh, they had desalination, so they could run that. But eventually, they're going to run out of coal or whatever they're firing the engine with, and the desalination's not going to work, and they're all going to die of thirst or starve to death. Nightmares. While most passengers enjoyed the trip from Adelaide to Durban, one passenger, Claude Sawyer, an experienced sea traveler and engineer, was less enamored with the experience. When the ship reached Durban, Sawyer, who was booked through to Cape Town with the option of continuing on to London, left the ship and sent a telegram to his wife stating, Thought the Waratah top heavy. Landed Durban. Sawyer's intention was to reach London, but since he was only paid up to Cape Town, his departure from the ship in Durban isn't quite the big deal that many articles make it out to be. Was Sawyer a particularly good judge of ships, or did he just have a little help from the Great Beyond? Um, no, he obviously didn't have help from the Great Beyond, because that's not real. However, I do believe that he could sort of, if he's like an experienced sail ship person, and he's like, oh, that ship is top heavy, that doesn't look very good. And then he's like, he has a nightmare about it, and he's like, yeah, actually, this is pretty bad. This does look pretty bad. I'm going to get off this ship. I think that's totally reasonable to have a dream about it because it's something he thought about in the day. And uh, yeah, just this just points to the fact that, okay, so the ship maybe wasn't as stable as everyone thought. This Sawyer guy saw it. He got off, and then the ship sunk at sea. Where's the mystery? <laughs> Sawyer claimed that he had had the same nightmare three times in one night while the ship was making her way to Durban. In the dream, a bloodstained figure wielding a long sword in his left hand, holding a rag saturated in blood in the other, rose from the sea and then disappeared beneath the waves. Many articles embellish this dream, but I find it pretty unsettling as it is. Yeah, it's a weird dream. But also, to say you had the same dream three times in one night. Is anyone ever really sure about that? Because you know you wake up and you're like, oh my god, I kept having the same dream last night. The, the odds are... I mean, you're just, or you're just as likely, because dreams are a very weird thing, that maybe you just dreamt that you had that dream three times. See you in your dreams. Like, it's this very blurry, unconscious state, and 
to say that you you know when have you ever been certain about that you're like i kept dreaming about this what did i keep dreaming that i was dreaming about that we're never sure because it's a dream what you're absolutely certain about is that it's not some message from jesus there are different accounts of what happened next some articles claim that sawyer wisely kept the dream to himself and considering it a warning against danger left the ship in durban however other articles claim that sawyer discussed his nightmare with fellow passengers alexandra hay from coventry england was on her way back home with her daughter she was disturbed by the dream but not disturbed enough to leave the ship so I next tried to convince John Ebsworth, a solicitor, on his way to London to get off in Durban with him. However, Ebsworth, while agreeing that it was indeed a disturbing dream and possibly even an omen, also refused to leave the ship and suggested that Sawyer talk to Father Faddle. The South African priest merely scoffed at Sawyer's tale. What can I say? Oh, we could be a cynical lot. Yeah, I'd do exactly the same thing. And then the next day I'd be like, you know, doing my like fathery stuff. Like, praise be, praise be, under his eye, blah, blah, blah and then the ship starts to sink and i'll be like oh man that sawyer guy did have that weird dream and then i would be like oh what a coincidence and then i'll drown to death like that's it i wouldn't think more about it even if it was actually happening to me according to one source sawyer even mentioned his concerns to captain ilbury who unsurprisingly didn't make sailing decisions based on the dreams of passengers and he dismissed both sawyer and his dream however according to sawyer's own testimony he never told the captain why he left the ship he told the manager of the union castle line mr hadfield about his nightmares the morning after departing the ship this did wonders for his credibility since he mentioned his concerns before the waratah disappeared while i'm not a firm believer in the power of premonition i'm inclined to think that being an experienced traveler and engineer sawyer realized that something was fundamentally wrong with the ship however not having any nautical knowledge or ship design experience he might not have been able to pinpoint what was bothering him he claimed to have shared his concerns with fellow passengers but there's no one left to verify whether this was indeed the case true premonition or sheer dumb luck leaving the waratah in durban saved his life it's neither true premonition or sheer dumb luck he saw something wrong with it he was like oh i've got experience about this sort of shippy stuff or like engineering stuff and then he had a dream um where he dreamt about that feeling and then he was like okay cool i don't think the ship is sound i'm getting off peace out hombres not a big deal it's neither true premonition or dumb luck he uh was experienced and he used that knowledge to avoid his death easy however sawyer wasn't the only ones have premonitions the chief officer of the clan mcintyre cg phillips who later became commodore of the clan line suggesting him to be a capable and level-headed individual came across a specter of his own according to phillips some hours after the final signal to the waratah he was standing on the bridge when he saw another ship an old-fashioned sailing vessel he claims not to be the superstitious type but the ship reminded him of the flying dutchman a legendary ghost ship the specter disappeared in the direction taken by the waratah and phillips had a bad feeling that some kind Kind of disaster was to befall the ill-fated ship and unfortunately he was right sightings the doomed ship's meeting with clan mcintyre is considered the last confirmed sighting but it wasn't the only sighting even many years after her disappearance unconfirmed sightings of wreckage kept cropping up some of these sightings can be explained or at least a reasonable alternatives have been suggested but there are a few that should have been taken a little bit more seriously in my opinion on july the 27th the Gulf, a Union Castle liner, passed a ship during a storm at around 9.30 p.m. The ship was about five miles away and heading in the opposite direction towards Cape Town. They exchanged signals, but due to the poor visibility, they could only make out the last three letters of the ship's name, T-A-H. That sounds very dramatic, however, when you dig a little bit deeper, the real story is slightly different. Firstly, according to both Mr. Blanchard, the third officer of the Gulf, and the captain, there was a strong westerly wind, but no storm. The storm hit the Gulf the next day. Blanchard reported that the ship appeared to be a passenger vessel, but he was unable to estimate her speed or precise heading. The ship was visible for around 10 to 15 minutes, which is more than enough time at the very least to get her name. One article suggested that the third officer was actually chatting with another ship when the captain entered the bridge. The other ship signed off using the informal tartar, and our officer needed to explain why he was gossiping with the neighbors instead of doing his job. Don't worry, buddy, we've all been there. Yeah, this just seems like it was another ship. And this is the problem with these, like, ghost stories and shit. Like, they just get bandied around the internet and repeated and repeated until finally Snopes are like, no! <laughs> No, 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 no. No, no, no! Uh, but they do, and it leads to these kind of exaggerations and mistellings. And it's not just the internet, it's done like in books and stuff before that. And so they just get blown out of proportion. But we're here to set that right and make something that's uh, kind of fun and interesting less interesting. <laughs>
but true. Another sighting on the open seas came from the SS Harlow. On the evening of the 27th, some crewmen aboard the Harlow reported seeing a ship around 10 to 12 miles behind them. It was clear that she was working hard against the heavy seas, and the captain saw a great deal of smoke, making him wonder if the ship was on fire. When night fell, they could still see the other vessel's running lights behind them. The Harlow was around three miles off Cape Hermes, uh, when the shipmate saw two bright flashes coming from the ship's direction, followed by complete darkness. It's worth noting that no one reported anything that sounded like an explosion. Instead of noting this in the ship's log, the shipmate decided that the flashes were simply from brush fire on the shore, which isn't uncommon in the area at that time of year. They only realized its possible significance when they arrived in port and learned of the missing ship. Could this have been flares? They were setting off flares? Why is it with ships and it wasn't the Titanic? It wasn't that they were setting off the flares and stuff and people were like, oh, they're having a nice fireworks display. <laughs> amazing how about we just don't have fireworks displays or fires visible at sea so that when there's flashes ships are like uh oh let's go check that out rather than like oh lovely however when dry brush in south africa catches fire which it does quite regularly it burns with the enthusiasm of a six-year-old in a candy store we're not talking one or two flashes we're talking about walls of flame that can be seen for miles when things really get growing did the crew of the harlow see the end of the waratah or the beginnings of a brush fire oh it, like, like not fireworks or whatever or flares but it was it caught on fire or something totally possible another sighting of the waratah's possible demise came from land edward joe conqueror mounted rifleman stationed on the wild coast was watching the seas through a telescope on either the 27th or the 28th of july sources differ on the exact date his unit was scheduled for live shell fire practice and signaling exercises conquer claims that while stationed on the knoll on the bank of the xora river with a fellow soldier he saw a ship around four miles offshore the ship matching the waratah's description was struggling against heavy seas and moving in either a southwesterly or northwesterly direction again sources differ a wave rolled over her, and before she could right herself another wave rolled over her and she disappeared around three days after this sighting a newspaper arrived at the camp with news that the waratah was overdue in cape town he claimed that he reported this sighting to mcr headquarters initially by semaphore and then later in writing and apparently some wreckage was found in the area not long after he sure he saw a ship disappear however this flotsam was carried off by locals the mounted rifleman did carry out a search along the coast when the waratah vanished yet none of this flotsam was ever recovered or identified so there are a few problems with conquer's version of events firstly there's no record of a report in the documentation collected for the inquiry into the waratah's disappearance held in london so the person in charge of gathering evidence from the colonies didn't contact the military authorities in south africa or if he did uh, there was no report on file neither conquer never reported the sighting as he claimed or his superiors didn't consider the report important enough to file and simply threw it away conquer also claimed that the ship was 240 degrees from his position this would put her inland so he probably meant 60 degrees he also claimed that the ship was around four miles out to sea but there was a storm coming in so visibility would have been poor making it difficult to estimate how far away she really was this guy doesn't sound very competent does he conquer was later promoted to the position of sergeant major and eventually became a commissioned officer it can Considering Conker's military career, I'm inclined to believe that he wasn't prone to imagining things or making up stories. You need a level head to do well in a military environment. While he probably saw a ship, he didn't see her sink. He only saw her disappear. Considering the rough seas, it's possible she changed course or just disappeared from view due to poor visibility. There was a storm coming in after all. There were a few more sightings from the coast. A police officer patrolling on horseback reported seeing a ship sink off the Transgay coast. An illegal diamond prospector, Jan Pretorius, claimed to have seen a large steamer in late July from the banks of the Mabash River, and apparently a life buoy labeled TSS Waratah was found by natives in the mouth of Mabashe River. A trader from Willow Vale also claimed to have seen a large steamer too close to the reefs while camping near the Xora River. However, none of these could be verified. Why are people just not looking into this? he saw a lifeboat no one's got that lifeboat what happened to it there's no evidence and why would people make up these stories i don't believe that they made them up i believe that they definitely get embellished over time i don't know why none of this evidence is kept or logged properly but i still just believe the ship sank and maybe some people tried to escape some debris washed up on shore bada bing bada boom sinking ship sinks smart and then there were the dead bodies oh, okay firstly a number of crewmen aboard the ss in Siswa claimed to have spotted four bodies two dressed in black 
two dressed in white, ten miles off the Mabashe River mouth, being tossed about by a strong southwest Agulus current on either the 11th or the 13th of August. However, due to rough seas, the bodies couldn't be retrieved. A tugboat left from East London and the Miltiades, supposed to sail from Durban to Cape Town, also searched the area where the Incis were reported seeing bodies, but nothing was found. Since there were no other reports of persons missing at sea, it's possible that the bodies were passengers or crew from the doomed Waratah. The claims were later dismissed by the inquiry, but the crewmen aboard insisted that they saw bodies in the water and they never wavered from this claim. I, yeah, why would they lie? There's no reason to lie. And I don't know why the inquiry dismissed it. I mean, probably because there's no evidence, but just take it into consideration. Why are you, are you not trying to look for a solution? Um, yeah, so Flotsam and the, the, the cargo from the ship and the people from the ship yeah, washing around in sea. What is no surprise when a ship sinks, a ship sinks. Then, early in August, several members of the SS Tottenham reported the body of a little girl in the water. She was seen around 20 to 25 miles southeast, south of East London. According to an apprentice, the girl was wearing a red dressing gown. However, the second maid said she was dressed in a red cape and black stockings and appeared to be about 10 or 12 years old. There were two sisters, the Shoreman sisters on board the Waratah, who would fit this age. However, not everyone agreed. The Tottenham's chief engineer claimed that it was a roll of paper in red wrapping. The captain immediately turned the ship around to locate the body and bring it on board. Sadly, by the time they returned to where the girl had been spotted, the currents had swept the body or roll of paper away. The third ship, the director, also reported dead bodies in the water around the same time, but I couldn't find anything more about this sighting. Three different ships independently reported seeing bodies in the water, so I'm inclined to believe that they saw something. The question is, what? At the time, there was a whaling station at Durban, and often offal from the station, such as dead sunfish and whale remains, was disposed of in the ocean. According to the captain of the Tottenham, that was what his crew saw. But what about the Inseas were? They insisted they saw bodies, but if not from the Waratah, where did these bodies come from? Whaling ships would sometimes be at sea for three years before they returned to the station. If a whaling ship went missing, it would take a very long time before anyone realized something was amiss. Jesus, can you imagine going out for three years? That's crazy. Like, just like, I'm going to sea for three years to catch some whales. I'll see you soon, family. <laughs> three years? It's an enormously long time. It'd be very effective, though. If, my, if I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm going to go to the office for three years. I'd come back after having done an enormous amount of work. It would be a lot. <laughs> My family probably wouldn't appreciate it though. They'd be like, you look older. It's like, yeah, I've been gone three years. The kids are like now four. They'd be like six and four. That's crazy. My kids, that is. Obviously. Some ships, like the Charles W. Morgan, a wooden whaling ship, would process the entire whale out of sea. This included boiling meat and blubber. A fire on a wooden ship covered in oil and grease is a health and safety violation waiting to become a full-fledged incident. Oh my god, that does seem insane. It would go up like a South African veld in August and sink fast. A whaling vessel catching fire would explain the flames reported by the Harrow. And a warship out of sea also reported seeing a ship on fire in the Cape Hermes area around the same time. It also wasn't uncommon for the captain's family to accompany him on extended trips, so there might have been children on board. If the crew and passengers of a burning ship managed to launch lifeboats, the storm wouldn't be their only concern. All the whale offal would attract sharks, so anyone ending up in the water wouldn't have a chance. In fact, one of the witnesses on the Tottenham claimed that he saw the torso of a human being who was most likely the victim of a shark attack. So, did the bodies in the water come from the Waratah, or an unfortunate whaling ship that was only reported missing months or even years later? Well, aren't we in the future so we can look up about those missing ships? All of these sightings occurred between Port St. John's and just south of East London. That's around 200 kilometers of coastline. Considering the southerly currents in the area, the ship in question had gone down north of East London. Oh my god, this is a lot of east, north, south, southerly. <laughs> Okay, possibly a little north of Port St. John's and the bodies drifted south with the current. The Harlow's report and Joe Conker's sighting from land also occurred on this stretch of coast. Of course, all of these sightings placed the Waratah too far north. Based on her speed and heading, when she met up with Clan McIntyre, she should have been much further south. However, the reports consistently placed the Waratah on the same stretch of coast. And I find it unlikely that all of the witnesses were lying or just imagining things. So what if she turned around? If the Waratah ran into mechanical difficulties, Captain Arbor Ilbury, being an experienced sailor, might have chosen to turn back to Durban instead of facing a storm with a distressed ship. In this case, she would have been running against a strong current while trying to outrun a violent storm, so she wouldn't have made good time. I'm not a sailor, but considering what we know, this theory seems plausible to me. It seems very plausible. It seems almost like yeah that seems like the most likely outcome and obviously it disappeared so we don't know what 
the outcome is but it's always like yeah just go with the most likely one no until we know different in the years following her loss occasional reports of wreckage surfacing have made the rounds in 1910 some wreckage washed up in mossel bay and in 1939 cork and timber washed up near east london in south africa but there's no proof that it came from the waratah in 1911 a life preserver marked waratah washed up on the coast of new zealand unfortunately there's no way to know whether the preserver went overboard while the waratah was still in australian waters or after she disappeared really i mean the ship goes missing do you assume that the life preserver was from the ship before it went missing or after is it insane like obviously it's afterwards i mean of course it could have happened beforehand but what is more likely in 1925 a pilot in the south african air force lieutenant dj ruse reported seeing a wreck in the water while flying over the transkey coast he spotted the outline of a large ship offshore near the sora river and was of the opinion that it could be the waratah joe conker who saw the ship disappear and lieutenant ruse met in an officer's mess and compared notes drawing a rough sketch of the area indicating where they believed the waratah might be however lieutenant ruse only spotted the wreck once despite Despite flying this particular route many times the spot was checked with sonar searches many years later but no ship was found in 1962 bill elston was flying over the transkey coast and also spotted a passenger ship beneath the water he described the ship of being as being of intermediate size but couldn't see whether she had a funnel or masts however a breeze rippled the ocean and the ship disappeared never to be seen again Emlyn Brown started his search with the Waratah as early as 1983, and in 1997 he thought that it finally found her. Financed by adventure writer Clive Cussler. Wow. No, what? Founder of NUMA, National Underwater and Marine Agency. Emlyn Brown and his team used a submersible ship from California to dive down to the shipwreck. That is awesome. <laughs> I mean, I get that Clive Cussler is an adventure writer, but the fact that he's like funding real life adventures is awesome. What a legend. It's been a long time since I've read a Clive Cussler book. It was not their first joint endeavor. The two men dedicated years to finding the Waratah. When a side scan sonar by a research vessel discovered a shipwreck off the Zora River mouth uh, in 375 feet or 170 meters of water, they thought that they'd finally found the prize. A high resolution survey done by Brown and Dr. Ramsey in 1999 confirmed that there was, in fact, a wreck on the ocean floor. Unfortunately, this was not the wreck of the Waratah, but rather the Nail Sea Meadow, a transport ship carrying military hardware and was one of many ships torpedoed in 1943 by german u-boats a one fred crony a staff member of the daily dispatch apparently had a map of the wild coast coastline in his office a point off the Mabase river mouth was marked with a cross and notation reading here lies the waratah we'll never know how he knew this what otherworldly insight he had had but considering that the waratah simply vanished without a trace his guess is as good as any i suppose wait why don't we just what? Why haven't they gone and looked for it? Just go down there and have a look. Clive Cussler, fun that. Go down there, take the submarine down and be like, oh, okay, it's not there. It's probably not there. How would he know this? And if it is, cool. Very cool. The inquiry. Disasters of any kind have a tendency to generate a whole lot of paperwork, and thus to satisfy the bureaucracy gods, an inquiry was held in London in 1910 when it finally became clear that the Waratah wasn't going to be found anytime soon. Passengers and crew from the ship's maiden voyage were called to testify, but the testimonies differed wildly. Some considered the Waratah to be one of the safest and most stable ships that ever traveled with, while others claimed the exact opposite. Claude Sawyer, the man whose nightmare saved his life, was among those called to testify. According to Sawyer's testimony, he noticed a big list to port when the ship left Melbourne, and when the ship encountered turbulent weather on the way to Durban, she wobbled about a good deal and then listed over to starboard, where she remained for a long time. While recovering from a roll, she would often jerk, causing injury to some passengers. Mrs. K would hurt her arm and hip in one incident, and in relatively smooth seas, Dr. Fulford and Ms. Lassells were injured after being knocked off off their feet in one instance while he was taking a bath the ship rolled and he was able to judge by the bath water that she had rolled at least 45 degrees that 45 degrees is a hell of a list that's like halfway to 90 i know i'm stating the obvious here but that's a hell of a list can you imagine a room being at 45 degrees you would not be able to stay on your feet you'd have no chance you'd fall down to the corner of the room 
You're in a bath. The bathroom's gonna get very wet. When he asked one of the officers on board to confirm the angle, he was told that it wasn't a cause for concern. He also mentioned that the ship took longer than usual to right herself after a what roll, which he found to be very worrying, and other witnesses echoed this sentiment. Physicist Professor William Bragg was a passenger on the Waratah's maiden voyage and testified that, while in the Southern Ocean, the Waratah developed a list to starboard to such an extent that water would not run out of the baths, and this list was held for several hours before she rolled upright. Professor Bragg theorized that the ship's metacenter was below her center of gravity. When she met a center, it sounds like somewhere Facebook operate out of. When she slowly rolled to one side, she would reach a point of equilibrium and would stay in that position until either a shift in the sea or the wind pushed her upright again. Other passengers and crew would also comment on the Waratah's lack of stability, and some of the crew handling the ship in port claimed that she was so unstable when unladen that she couldn't be moved without ballast. This isn't unusual for cargo ships since they're built to carry heavy loads, so however, the crew handling her in port would be aware of this, so the fact that they came forward testifying the ship to be dangerously unstable does suggest that something about the Waratah oh, was concerning to those who knew better. Yeah, this ship just sounds like a bit of a piece of sh to be honest. Well, just as I thought, trash. And uh, the reason that is missing is because it was shit. There was a big storm that other people struggled with and this piece of crap didn't and it sank and everyone died. Yeah, mystery solved, right? Big brain. Wow! I'm so smart! Correspondence between Captain Ilbury, the managers of the Blue Anchor Line, and the builders of the ship showed some contradictions in letters to the managers of the Blue Anchor Line. The captain commented on some of the details the ship's fixtures, fittings, cabins, public rooms, and ventilation, to name a few, but there seems to be no mention of the Waratah's seaworthiness or handling at sea. Some speculate that the captain had concerns about the Waratah's stability, but for some reason never raised his concerns in these letters specifically. However, Barclay Curl, the builders of the ship, told a different story when they revealed letters written by Captain Ilbury where he mentions concerns regarding the stability of the ship. There were also some angry letters between the builders and London Sons, the owners of the Blue Anchor Line, about stowage issues aboard the ship. The owners later claimed that it was simply a bluff to get financial settlements from the builders. While I'm sure this is considered fraud and illegal, it's clear there were some concerns about the ship's stability when carrying cargo, which should have been addressed before she left port a second time. However, expert witnesses all agreed that the Waratah was built properly. According to Mr. F.N. Lang, speaking on behalf of the Board of Trade, there had been no reports of problems after the Waratah's maiden voyage. Wait, wasn't there a physicist saying that it was leaning too much and all this stuff? It sounds like there were problems, just people are covering it up. I'm guessing he forgot about the coal bunker fire. Yeah, and the listing and all of this stuff. Like, there were clearly problems. It does seem like a cover-up. There were claims that Captain Elbury told the captain of the Mongolia that the ships that the second trip would be the Waratah's last unless significant alterations were made. However, the captain of the Mongolia had never met Captain Elbury, so where exactly this rumor came from is a bit unclear. Okay, that just sounds like one of those things that gets made up over time. According to Mr. Barry, Chief Scientific Department of Barclay, Curl & Co., the builders, all experiments conducted with the Waratah when she was first launched were satisfactory. The Waratah was superior with regards to width and depth. Unlike some ships, the consumption of coal, which would lessen the load, wouldn't affect her stability. Even if the ship rolled so far to one side that her masts were parallel to the surface of the ocean, the ship would still be able to right herself. In fact, a weight of 290 tons placed on one side would be needed for the ship to list even 15 degrees. He firmly believed that the ship wouldn't list enough for it to roll over completely. Um, I'm sorry, but obviously there's witness testimony. People were saying it was listing a hell of a lot more than 15 degrees. We talked about it listing 45 degrees. And how insane that would be. It sound, um, and obviously the builders of the ship have a strong interest in their lives. Fine when we built it. It was fine. Uh, but obviously something changed. Because I don't think the random professor or whoever would lie. What reason does he have to lie? Whereas you're the builder of the ship. you got a strong incentive to lie. Allegedly. <laughs> this is like 100 years ago. <laughs> Not particularly concerned, but still. Allegedly. The Waratah passed numerous inspections by her builders, her owners, the Board of Trade, as well as two inspections by Lloyds of London, who insured the vessel and gave her their top rating. This rating was only given to ships inspected and assessed by Lloyds throughout the design, construction, and sea trials process. Crew members, ranking from stokers to a deck officer, as well as passengers aboard her maiden voyage, claim that the Waratah Waratah was perfectly stable, especially stable, according to some, with a comfortable, easy roll. Considering all these contradictions, you'd think that someone was lying. 
But that's not necessarily the case. Many passenger ships of the period were slightly top-heavy. This gave the ship a long, comfortable, but unstable roll, which is more preferable for many passengers than a short, jarring, but stable roll. After a few voyages, the crew learned how to load and handle the ships correctly, so the majority of these ships were active without any major issues for decades. However, the Waratah ran into an unusually heavy storm on her second voyage before the crew really had a chance to get to know her little ticks. This design could explain why the witnesses gave such strongly opposed testimonies. An inexperienced or uninformed traveler might have interpreted the long, slow, soft roll as comfortable and safe, while an experienced sailor or traveler like Cord Sawyer would have experienced the same motion as unstable. The Waratah was also a combination cargo and passenger liner, which complicated things a little bit. Passenger liners have a relatively small cargo volume relative to their gross tonnage and therefore have predictable ballast requirements. However, the Waratah could carry a variety of different cargoes on the same voyage, especially when she wasn't carrying that many passengers, uh, which would have made the ballasting more complex and correct stowage more crucial. If the cargo suddenly shifted due to a violent storm, it could certainly have contributed to the ship rolling over too far to recover and capsizing. In the end, Blue Anchor Lines wasn't directly blamed for the tragedy, but their reputation was ruined and no one was very keen to use their ships. No real surprise there. They soon went bankrupt and were forced to sell their remaining fleet to the P&O Company in 1910. Wow, P&O. Are they still around? They were around when I was a kid. You'd take a P&O ferry from um, the, the UK to France. It would cross the, the channel. These big, big things with P&O on the side. Wow. I've been around a long time. I'm, I'm gonna look it up. Are they still in business? I haven't heard of them in a long time, and I feel like they might have been destroyed by the Channel Tunnel. Nope, still around. British shipping company that operates ferries from the United Kingdom to Ireland and continental Europe. The company was created in 2002. Oh, P&O Ferries, uh, through mergers and acquisitions within P&O. Okay, so some weird corporate stuff happened. It's now owned by Dubai. <laughs> okay. Or some Dubai-based DP world. Fascinating. Series. The only thing we know for a fact is that the Waratah was last seen at 9.30am on the 27th of July by the Clan McIntyre. There are many theories, but so far no one has been able to find a wreck or explain how a 450-foot steam ocean liner managed to disappear without a trace, taking her passengers and crew with her. Some of the theories are just ridiculous and fairly confident we can rule out alien involvement or interdimensional portals, so let's focus on the more likely theories. A storm. Yeah. <laughs> there was a bit. The Waratah was a bit sh. There was a big storm. Boom. <laughs> Come on. That's it. The most likely theory, and the one settled on by the inquiry, is that the Waratah was lost during a storm. The Cape of Good Hope has many other names. The coastline is known as the Wild Coast, the Cape of Storms, and my personal favorite, the Graveyard of Ships. <laughs> oh, good lord. There are 26 wrecks just around Cape Town itself, itself, and some estimate that between 2,500 and 3,000 ships have sunk off the South African coast since the 1500s. I'm not sure how accurate this is, but since the list of shipwrecks off the Overberg Municipal Area, which covers about 160 miles of coastline, is five pages long with an average of 30 entries per page i can believe it that is an incredible number of ships one theory proposed that the waratah encountered a rogue wave while sailing through the storm the captain of the clan mcintyre described as the worst he'd ever seen rogue waves are thankfully not that common and they were considered to be a nautical myth for many years i feel like i made a video about this how people were like nah that's not real and then they recorded them and it's like oh my god just giant waves when they i swear they were like 10 meters high or 30 meters high or something insane just like one random wave that bang destroys a ship brutal savage wrecked it's only in the last few years that rogue waves have been considered to be an actual thing essentially a rogue wave can be greater than twice the size of the surrounding waves and since they often come from a different direction than the prevailing winds they're highly unpredictable some reports describe them as a wall of water steep sided with an unusually deep through according to national geographic the spot with the highest frequency of rogue waves is you guessed it off the coast of south africa in 2020 a rogue wave of 17 yeah i knew they were mass 17.6 meters i don't know what that is in feet i'm what 180 centimeters is 511 so is that's got to be like 60 feet that's nuts hey siri what's 17.6 meters in feet oh, that's what i said 70 meters look it's big <laughs> Uh, that was recorded off of Vancouver Island. However, while it may be officially the highest on record, there are tales of rogue waves up to 24 meters high. A research suggests that rogue waves off the south coast, of, the southeast coast of South Africa, where they are most likely to happen, can easily reach up to 20 meters. That's roughly the length of a 
tennis court. The combination of the strong Agulhas currents and the narrow continental shelf is probably to blame, but for those facing a rogue wave, where it came from it really isn't that important in the moment. If the Waratah was a little unstable due to some design flaw, being hit by a giant wave oh, would have been disastrous. She was carrying 6,500 tons of cargo, so if the cargo dislodged, the shifting cargo would have certainly have contributed to the Waratah turning turtle and sinking. If she did roll over completely, any debris and bodies would be trapped under the wreck, which might explain why nothing was ever found. Many perfectly seaworthy vessels without any design issues have been very badly damaged in violent storms around the Cape of Good Hope. Uh, we love irony. Around the Cape of Good Hope. An unstable ship oh, would have a snowball's chance in hell against a 20-meter wave. An explosion. Another theory suggests the possibility of a fire or catastrophic explosion on board. A fire on board might explain the flashes spotted by the Harlow. Coal dust can be self combustible under the right circumstances, so an unfortunate series of events could lead to an explosion on board. Many proponents of this theory point out that the Waratah suffered a coal bunker fire on a maiden voyage. The fire burned for two days before it could be extinguished. However, the Waratah was repaired when she returned to port, so whatever damage caused the fire was obviously rectified at the time. Yeah, but that doesn't mean it can't happen again. It's like, yeah, we fixed it. Uh, yeah, or, or like, they treated it. Like, you treat it, but they didn't cure the problem, right? Maybe they didn't. Smarter people than me stated that it would be unlikely for the same issue to cause another fire so soon. Many believe this theory also explains the lack of wreckage, but I'm not so sure. If the Waratah did catch fire, it seems unlikely that no one was able to launch any lifeboats before she went down, and an explosion oh, would have turned a big ship into small pieces. Some of those pieces would float, so there should be some wreckage. Adrift and lost in, untanked, in Antarctic waters. The last theory worth considering is that the Waratah ran in mechanical trouble and always set adrift. If Captain Ilbury steered for open seas, unwilling to risk being too close to the rocks on the coast in a storm, she would have been too far out to sea for vessels traveling near the coast to see her signals calling for help. In 1937, the Nottingham Evening, Evening Post published an article speculating that the Waratah drifted south, possibly all the way to the waters of Antarctica, where she finally founded or was crushed by the ice. If the passengers on board didn't drown during a freak storm, they would have been left to die of starvation and cold. She was well stocked, so I find starvation unlikely. If she did make her way to Antarctica, I think hypothermia and disease more likely killed those on board. Either way, it would have been a hor horrifying experience for the passengers and crew. I mean, yes, possible. I think the storm one is just more likely. Even if it's not a rogue wave, just this big storm. Big storm. A story published by the Daily Standard of Queensland on the 5th of September 1913 gave some credence to the Antarctica theory. The leader of the Australian Antarctic expedition, Douglas Mawson, claimed to have come across what could be the wreck of the Waratah in the narrow inlet of a bay while exploring south of base camp. Three attempts were made to reach the wreck, but a blizzard finally made that impossible. They did manage to recover a life boy marked Waratah and even reported seeing footprints suggesting possible survivors. However, the story was a hoax. Ah, I was like, well, that settles it that easy. Uh, the Daily Mail wanted to see if their rival, the Daily Standard, was stealing their stories, and the Daily Standard fell for the ploy hook, line, and sinker. Oh, savage. Daily Standard's not around anymore, at least as far as I understand. Oh, maybe it could be the Evening Standard now? But the Daily Mail is definitely around. It's pretty, pretty sh newspaper, to be honest. Um, yeah. Daily Standard. Don't know that one, though. That's right, I said it! Other theories suggested a whirlpool, a methane upsurge, or running aground on an uncharted reef, but none of these theories are very plausible in my honest opinion. She was too big to be sucked down by a whirlpool. A methane upsurge is incredibly unlikely, and if she hit an uncharted reef close to the coast, the wreck uh, would most likely have been found. Another theory floating around is that she had fallen victim to pirates as she was carrying 300 tons of gold bullion. Was she really? No, this is just a legend. However, there's no record of the Waratah carrying any gold, so I think this is unlikely. 300 tons is an absolutely extraordinary amount of gold. Conclusion The Waratah was probably doomed from the start. Between 1848 and 1894, four ships carrying the name Waratah were lost. On top of that, she was called unsinkable. Ships are like cats. The minute you call them unsinkable, they'll do their best to prove you wrong and sink at the first possible opportunity. But ships go down all the time, so why is the Waratah considered such a nautical mystery? Firstly, at 450 foot, the Waratah was a pretty big ship, yet she disappeared without a trace. On top of that, she went missing along a very busy shipping lane. I don't know how true this is for other beaches, but you can stand on any beach between the ports of Durban and Cape Town and you'll likely see a ship. It's pretty crowded. 
yeah this is so true like if you're by the sea and you look out there's gonna be some big boats out there like big shipping boats with stuff on them the captain might have put her further out to sea and any visibility was very poor but she likely found it while there was more than one ship close enough to help finally there was no wreckage and despite searches going on for almost 50 years now no sign of a wreck has been found if she went down in the middle of the atlantic that would make sense but it's possible that she sank within sight of the south african coast the air search area is considerably smaller than it was for the titanic so where the hell is she the documentary on Emil Brown's search for the Waratah is a story about adventure, but seeing the wreck of the Nelsea Meadow lying on the ocean floor, dark and silent, never to traverse the seas again, was a sobering sight. It wasn't the Waratah, but it reminded me that this isn't just a story. 211 people died, and their last moments, trapped on a ship with nothing but the icy cold waters beckoning them, must have been terrifying. This is not The Casual Criminalist, that's another show that I do, check it out. But just this once, I think we need to remember, not just the Waratah, but all the souls on board that she carried with her into the depths of the stormy waters around the Cape of Good Hope. Yeah, and that's where we end today's episode, that, um, <laughs> for all the mystery, it's like it's a missing ship that went down in a storm, isn't it, in my opinion. Let me know what you think in the comments below, and uh, I'll see you in the next episode. Thanks for watching.